Ew. Wendy, do you think you're an extrovert or an introvert? Well, I think I might be, uh, I'm probably an introvert, but I'm disguised as an extrovert. You know, I, I like talking to, I'll, I'll talk to like pretty much anybody, but I, I won't tell them anything. <laughs> so I'm what kind about of the, you? Same kind of deal. Uh, I, I always thought I was an introvert and I would tell people that I was and they'd be, no, how can you be an introvert? You know, you're a broadcaster, but they associate most people associate introversion with being shy or socially yeah. awkward, which I was as a kid. I'm not anymore, but, but I'm not an extrovert. John will tell you this because I find social situations more draining than not. And so what I just discovered is I I'm an ambivert. An amber. I don't even know what an ambivert is. What, what is an ambivert? What I think we are. It's an extroverted introvert. I need a lot yeah. of alone time, but I do enjoy other people, but only under certain circumstances. I'm selectively social. So that's what that is. Well, there's nothing wrong with being an introvert and an extrovert. And amber, well, well, all maybe the verts are fine. all the verts. Well, yeah, except maybe pervert. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then, you know, who are, who are we to judge? Who are we? Who are we to judge? <laughs> <laughs> Our guest this week might be able to shed some light on how we draw uh, energy or uh, inject energy into situations. Colin Mockery is one of the greatest improvisers to never pick up a script. Uh, you know him from Whose Line Is It Anyway, both the UK and American versions of the uh, hit improv show. Go on, what else has he done? Well, he has a very long history. I don't know how far back we want to go, uh, but he was at Second City, uh, which is, well, I don't know, means a lot to me. But he he was there a couple of years after I left Toronto. Um, but you've probably seen him in countless commercials, television shows. He's constantly working. He is, without a doubt, one of the busiest performers in this country. He's currently on tour with Brad Sherwood, uh, another improv genius in the show called Scared Scriptless. Yeah. <laughs> Get it? We're, yeah, I get, I get it. <laughs> that one actually did not go over my head. Oh, we're so glad to welcome Colin uh, to the show. What kind of vert are you, Colin? <laughs> Pervert, no. <laughs> it is so odd that this is the second time in like three days I've heard the term ambivert. Really? Um, huh. Yes. Uh, I was talking to it uh, about it with some friends. So I think I'm, I, I'm, that's what I am. I'm, I don't really enjoy uh, being with people. Uh, my wife is a uh, Deb is more the extrovert. I tend to be, she actually calls the guy on whose line the other, because it's <laughs> nothing like me in real life. Huh? Yeah. I used to have a work husband and then the real husband and I kind of occasionally got them confused, but so, so she's the extrovert. So at home, like you're both like improv geniuses. So like, do you both go off in quiet corners or do you like, is it a laugh-a-thon at home? Or? We, have, uh, we have a lot of laughs. We really do enjoy each other. But we also, uh, when, you know, the dark times happened uh, recently, <laughs> where we're, it was the longest I'd been home in 20 years. So there were some concerns about how that would work <laughs> out. And uh, Deb said, okay, here's the thing. We got to, uh, you know, the house is big enough that we can each go to a corner <laughs> and do what we have to do. And that worked out for us. We would, when we got together, it was great, but we also gave each other space to be alone and do what we had to do. I think spa the space that you had during the pandemic was crucial. And I felt for people who were in a small my son and his fiance at the time were in a small apartment with nowhere to go, uh, except here. They were in our, remember the bubbles? Remember we had bubbles? Um, oh. But my husband will tell you that I had a good pandemic because I didn't have to go anywhere. I didn't have, <laughs> I had an excuse and I kind of enjoyed it. I mean, not the scary part, not the, yeah. you know, is everyone going to die part, but the, the lack of pressure. But as a funny person, as a person who was funny, Mm -hmm. Do people expect you to be different? Like you said, the, the, like, as Deb says, the guy on stage and, and Colin are not necessarily the same people. Yeah, there's, there is an expectation. Um, I mean, there were, when I first, when we first move on to the street, people thought I was just, um, I guess a dick because I was, I, you know, I, I wouldn't ignore people. I'd say hello and stuff, but I, I would never engage in conversation because I, and so Deb had to explain, no, he's lovely. He's just, he's very shy. He doesn't, you know, feel comfortable talking to people. And now everyone sort of accepts it. And also, I mean, throughout the years, because of the success of Who's Line and the touring, I've had to find a way to become more uh, 
fake <laughs> and, and talk to people and enjoy it. And I actually, I, I, I do enjoy it more than I ever have. And I think it, it really can be a muscle that you can exercise and sort of get past the initial awkwardness of it. It's, I watched you for so many years. I mean, it was such a, a family thing to watch you on Whose Line Is It Anyway? It was just, to me, it's just the most brilliant show that's ever existed. And I haven't seen your new ones yet. But, um, I'm gonna, but you tweeted something about how it was so great to be with Ryan Stiles, who's been your buddy since probably longer than your wife, um, and and how great it was to do that show, but also that you never got residuals, um, mm -hmm. which is like a huge issue now with the strike happening in Hollywood and blah, 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 blah. So you're not doing it anymore, but I, like, can you actually, uh, like, how big a deal, uh, you said you didn't want to sound bitter, but it is kind of bitter. I mean, you, why are you bitter, you call it? <laughs> I am... Um, I have a bitter compartment, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it's very difficult for me. It really is um, an odd thing because any success I've ever had is all due to whose line. I mean, it gave us all careers, put us out uh, into the national spotlight and from that. But also there was that thing of, yeah, someone's making money from this and it's not the performers and we are providing all the content. I mean, we're not writers in the sense of, you know, we're sitting down typing out things, but we are writing as we go along. But there was never any um, category for that in which we could get paid. So um, it was always a little disconcerting when you see, oh, whose line sold to this streaming service or sold overseas and blah, blah, blah. And you go, okay, we're we're not getting a part of that. So um, I try not to be bitter because it doesn't really help and it's not going to no. go anywhere. So um, in my mind, you know, I, I do kill certain people every day, but I don't okay. talk about it. <laughs> and I, I, it actually makes me feel better. I didn't even realize, but of course, improv does not fall in into any category. But and you're writing it. That's, you want, you're, well, you're writing, writing it, as, it as you go along, but it that's that doesn't fall into the the like, the union. Yeah, so that's um, yeah, and I I I don't know if that'll ever <laughs> ever happen. I mean, you know, who's line? Well, my first who's line? My daughter was two months old. She just turned thirty three. So it's been going on for a while, and you would have figured it by this point. <laughs> they would have found out some way to sort of um, uh, give us money. But again, I can't complain because it's given me a career. You know, I'm touring all the time. I'm, I'm, I've gotten a lot of work because of Who's Line. So, so there. So there. Let's, uh, let's go back to partnerships. So yes, you've been you know, mm -hmm. joined at the hip with Ryan for so long with Ryan Styles, And now you're with Brad Sherwood, who was uh, sounds like you're dating. <laughs> now you're with Brad. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's funny because Wendy and I, this is the first time I've always worked with people, usually men on radio. Uh, Wendy's never had a partner before. Does it help if you're more similar or does it help if you're very different? Um, I, I don't think there's a difference. I'm trying to think. I mean, Ryan and I are very similar uh, in in many ways. And that worked out. Brad and I are a little more different. He's very verbal. He's very smart. Not that Ryan isn't smart, but I guess he isn't. <laughs> um, he's also a pervert. But, um, throw that out. <laughs> yeah, he's a pervert too. Um, but, uh, Brad is very, uh, yeah, very quick verbally. He brings a whole different skill set to our show. Uh, with Ryan and I, there's, um, I guess, because it's almost like a twin situation where I pretty much know all the time where he's going to go in a scene. Uh, and even if I don't, I know enough just to follow along and see what happens. So I, I think you can work either way. And with both of them, pretty much from the first time we worked together, it it worked. Um, there was, there's been only one time, Patrick McKenna um, from the Red Green Show and many other um, uh, wonderful shows, he and I were at Second City together. And he's one of my best friends. And we just could not work together. Huh? Why? For the first uh, couple of months, we were on stage. 
we realized it was because we were being too polite. We were each kind of sitting back and letting the other person take. And then once we realized, no, we have to be selfish and attack the scene, that's when we really start to click and started having a more of a give and take. And uh, But sometimes it takes a little while to find that chemistry. That's interesting that so you're, you're being too polite. Shut up, Wendy. No, no, you shut up. <laughs> Oh, you've got it down. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Sorry, go on. <laughs> Our whole podcast. No, you shut up. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, no, it is very strange having to work with a partner, especially a partner with a brain like this person over there, also named Maureen. Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm curious because we ran into you uh, recently at the celebration of life or whatever you want to call it for Gordon Pinsent. And, and, and you were there and you, you said that you're doing this new thing. Well, it's, actually it wasn't that new at that point uh, called hip -rov. So it's, you said, yeah, I'm doing like improv with hypnosis. And I'm like, Oh yeah. Okay. So like I, I tried hypnosis. I wanted to try and quit smoking and everyone's like, Oh, that's terrible. And I knew because it was my third time trying and it wasn't for me. So hypnosis to me is not serious. But then the more I read about you and Hiprov, it all kind of makes sense. And it sounds like some people really uh, can benefit from or at least get a few chuckles out of being hypnosis. Tell me more. I don't I don't know as much about this as what is it. So what, what is it? Here's what happens. Um, I'm with a hyp hypnotist, Asad Meki. He gets 20 volunteers, gets it down to the best four or five, and then they and I um, do an improv set. Yeah, that's basically it. Is this um, like the Great Ravine I, or something? Remember those hypno? Those hypno I do remember hats. the Great Ravine. Yeah, <laughs> I guess so. Um, I mean, it's very odd because, of, uh, you know, a lot of people are skeptical, not only of hypnotism, but improv, too. So we put these no. two skeptical art forms together so people can just stay in one spot and be skeptical. Um, <laughs> but I learned, I've learned, i learned throughout uh, doing the show, I had a lot of misconceptions uh, about uh, hypnosis. When we have the, the final four, it looks like they're sleeping, but they're aware the entire time. They're um, I'll do a scene with someone and they'll reference a scene that happened three scenes before that they weren't in and it looked like they were sleeping. When you're uh, for hypnotic shows like this, about 20% of the population can be hypnotized. It's the percentage is higher for clinical uh, hypnosis, like quitting smoking or getting over um, flying. But it's really, um, it's really been interesting uh, uh, doing it, working with people who I do not know in a hypnotic state, and they're just reacting to everything Assad and I say. And it's been uh, great. We're trying to show that everyone basically can improvise, which, as I think about it, is a bad career choice for me, <laughs> just to show up how easy that is. <laughs> but um, there's- So do you not so, look like when he's hypnotizing people? Do you uh, make sure- yeah, have you, not, to, like, to Wendy's point, have you been hypnotized? Uh, yes, he hypnotized me. And? Uh, just so, and it was uh, great. It was good. I I said, here's the thing. I constantly think I should write more, and I hate writing. I lazy. That's why I improvise. I said, so I want you to hypnotize me to make me write something, or to find it within me to find the discipline to do that. So he did, and I ended up writing something. So for me, it worked. Of course, now I'm not going to write ever again. <laughs> I'll have to go in again, but. But for that moment, it, it did help. And one night we had, every night we find a superstar, an improv superstar. And there was one night this young woman was amazing. And afterwards, I was talking to her about her experience. And she said, you know, I have crippling social anxiety. Mm -hmm. I still don't know why I went up there, but that was the best hour of my life. I've never felt so in control. I felt confident. And then she was going to start looking for improv classes and an improv troupe. So it's... Um, it kind of shows what happens when you get rid of that part of the brain that tells you, you can't do this. You're going to suck. You're not going to be funny. Um, so is that what it is? Cause I remember when I had my wisdom teeth pulled out and they gave me laughing gas. It was, I was, I was like, it's so hilarious. You could not believe how hilarious you were. Was. You were funny or you oh, found yeah, no, everything funny. No, I, I was just, yeah, well, I was were very funny. funny. Only I was stoned out of my mind with the laughing gas. Oh, so but they, it was but the, 
It was the best time I ever had. Did other people find you funny? Well, who knows? But I, I was just like killing myself. <laughs> but but what is there? Is there something about sort of letting go? Because I mean, a lot of people take drugs or do whatever to like mm-hmm. to, to to relax, to let their brain to say yes and I suppose, which is kind of like improv. What what is it? There's a uh, there's a doctor in uh, San Francisco, Dr. Charles Lim, who was doing a study on what happens to the brain when you improvise. So uh, Assad and I, we were doing a show in San Francisco. He contacted me and said, would you be willing to be a subject? So I improvised in an MRI for an hour and a half, <laughs> which is as horrible as it sounds. <laughs> um, I did find out I'm not claustrophobic. So that was a positive. Um, so. Um, what he found out was what happens when you improvise the part of the brain that deals um, with self-criticism activity lowers and the creative part of your brain gets more involved and the same thing happens when you are hypnotized the self-critical part of your brain activity goes away and you just become more creative and um it, i mean People always say, how can you improvise? It's the hardest thing in the world. And it, it isn't. It just goes against everything we do as humans. You have to listen. You have to accept ideas. And you try to make your partner look good. And that's it. Those are basically the three rules. Um, so it's been fascinating going through this, um, going through hip prop and seeing how people, once um, they're free, I mean, and let me get this, they, they do become great improvisers in that they just react immediately. They don't work towards the end of the scene. That's why I'm there, because <laughs> they'll just throw <laughs> things at me constantly. It's like, okay, I, okay, we have to make sense of this now. But it's uh, actually, I think, helped me as an improviser, because it's really helped me hone my listening skills more. And I've always been a really good listener. I've always loved um, part of my introvert self, I think, is just, I really do enjoy listening to people more than getting involved with them. Um, there's yeah, well, nothing that's better what, than That's what Maureen always says to me, just just listen, it's it's yes, and just agree with everything. And I'm like, yeah. Well, you don't but... have to, you don't have to agree with everything. Um, <clears throat> you have to listen, yeah. But you do have to listen. What, as interviewers, um, w- one of our worst faults, and I just don't mean Wendy and me, I mean, just anybody who does this, is that you're always thinking of the next question. You're not necessarily listening to the answer of the question that you just posed. You're thinking, okay, when they stop talking, I have to have something to say. And that's that's the end of, you know, that's the worst thing you can do because you're I thought that was just at CBC. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, <laughs> it's across the board. I and I've now linking improv and Second City together and I've I've taken some of those corporate courses that they teach at uh, at Second City where you bring in your whole team, it's fantastic team building. And and uh, teach you some mm-hmm. improv uh, exercises, and it always amazes me that it's often the most timid person. Or like, I, I worked at a radio station, and, and it was the accountant who was the, who killed that day. Um, and and it makes you realize that improv is something that everyone should learn to do, or learn or, or learn to enjoy, uh, not just performers. Oh, I, yeah. I always say, take a, even if you don't go into it, and I wouldn't recommend going into it as a profession, uh, it's a great <laughs> life skill to have. You know, it's you, you learn to be more relaxed around people. If you're, uh, if you're probably have to do presentations, it's a great skill to have. And um, with relationships, too, being able to listen and uh, work together to get past the little obstacles we often uh, reach in life. It really is invaluable. Who's um, with you being married to Deb and Deb was a director at second city. Uh, and mm-hmm. very, you, you're both extremely funny people, but you're very different funny people, aren't you? Yes. I'll, I'll expound on that. Um, Please. <laughs> we are. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it wasn't so much a question, but go ahead. In almost way, it's almost stereotypical uh, gender uh, funny. I think I tend to be more one-liners and jokey. Her stuff is a lot of, although she can also be uh, very funny with the one-liners. Her strength, I think, is doing 
character company. She's very good at coming up with different characters. Uh, she's very good at uh, coming up with a structure to a joke and a structure to a scene. She's a great writer. Um, so I, I think our styles mesh. I mean, at home, she tends to be the funnier one. Uh, you know, I let her uh, get a couple of laughs and then I'll come in every once in a while, but she <laughs> she pretty much keeps the day going. I want to pass on just on that note. So um, my younger uh, child uh, was at camp at Centauri and his counselor was your daughter. And he said that you and Deb came in and put on a show for the campers. This is at an arts camp called Centauri that's no longer, sadly. And he said, you absolutely killed. And I'm thinking, well, I should hope so. <laughs> yeah, really. It, it could if really go all the way. <laughs> that would be horrific. And, you know, and our daughter's there. So we really had to pick it up a little. I, speaking about style, I just wonder, like, you, you've you done so many shows over so many years, and now you're doing this hip hop uh, thing, and it's in L.A., which, you know, la-di-da, la you're in L.A., uh, but before that, you were in a bunch of Canadian cities. Um, you perform a lot, uh, both with Brad and with the hip hop thing um, in the States, and is there a difference? Because there's so, I, I'm, we're so glad you're in Canada. Uh, so many comedians have gone to the States, but is there is there a difference, I wonder? Like, do you... Like our people, I'm assuming the people that you hypnotize are the same, but are they different? Is the humor different? Like what's what's the difference or is there none? <laughs> there really is, there is. I mean, um, there is doing the show with Brad. We have to start off the show saying uh, we're not doing any political things. We're not going to take any political uh, suggestions because the audience immediately splits in half. Hmm. And our show is not a political show. Um, I. I I think, I believe anyway, to do an improvised political show would be uh, tough. I, I think you really have to have a strong point of view, and I think you have to have it written. Our stuff is just goofy, it's sort of universal, and it doesn't ruffle feathers. That's We're just there to have fun. And with the um, with Hiprov, it's interesting because we don't know what's going to come out of people and sometimes we we did this scene where i get two different animals i combine them and uh we do a funeral for this animal so it i think it was like a half platypus half zebra we're doing um the thing i and the mourners are there and i said to one mourner why i i know um that now of course you you mourn this pet but when the pet first came to your home you were not um, enthralled with it. Why? She said, it was an abomination of nature. <laughs> I thought, okay, that's something I don't want to keep going with. Yeah, no, <laughs> no. no. <laughs> I feel okay. So there are that one. Uh, there are times I feel I'm walking a little more up on eggshells because I also don't want stuff <laughs> to come out. This um, one of the other uh, we sometimes switch improvisers and there was one improviser jonathan uh mangum who works with uh, wayne brady and there was just this one person who just kept calling him a racist oh, <laughs> for no. no reason at all oh, no. and it was like okay well, good luck with the comedy <laughs> so are there standard questions that you ask like what do you i don't really get the whole process so so you you hypnotize people you figure out the people who them. are susceptible or whatever or who yeah. are funny. Um, and then Assad what? is looking as he's hypnotized and he's looking for uh, changes in their breathing their face becomes a little more mask like he has like these 15 20 things he's looking at sort of like when a poker player is looking for tells in the other uh, huh. uh, players and then uh, we get it down to the best five and then we play usually five different games and we have right now i guess about 20 games we can play so ranging from one is a scene where one of them has to propose to me uh we have that pet funeral one we have one of our uh which one is the, probably the most difficult the most complicated it's a 1940s film noir radio show one person does all the sound effects one person plays all the different characters I meet in the uh, solving of the, the murder. Wow. So, yeah, it's, and uh, I sing a, a duet with one of them, which is but always you can't scary. Sing. I heard you can't I know sing. that's the beauty because um, <laughs> through, through the show, I realized, well, these people are doing things. They come up here 
not knowing what to expect, and that's kind of brave of them. So why can't I do something that's even more terrifying? So, and it usually uh, it works out. The audience is quite forgiving. So, um, yeah, we have we have a a, a large uh, a group of games we're playing. We're still finding uh, games we can play with them because they can't do anything too like. We couldn't say, okay, in this game, every letter that has an S, the S is going to be substituted by the letter F. Those kind of things don't work. They have oh, to be simple letters. Like, you're in love with yeah. Paul and you want to marry him. That's it. It has That's to be it. a one sentence thing. Yeah. Wow. And then hope they don't talk about abominations. <laughs> it's a tight wa- it's a tight rope yes. act though, because in regular improv, you're you're as you said earlier, it's so much is based on trusting the other players. And in this case, mm-hmm. it's a wild card. You don't really know what you're going to get yeah it's i mean it's fascinating because i find myself really invested in well i don't have to do anything here they've kind of got control i'll just sit back and then there's okay they're starting to flounder time to come in yeah it's been very good for me watching you all these years and i actually saw you uh my my same son who went to camp with your daughter we saw you in london uh do whose line which was kind of a weird thing because we knew you from the american one and then anyway and, and of course, here we are in London. Let's go see a Canadian that we know in a show over there. But it was hilarious. Have you ever broken or have you ever floundered? Mm-hmm. I ne- I mean, I saw you live as opposed to the show, which is mm-hmm. edited. And we, we both came, both Ronan and I came away going, how on earth do they keep the plates in the air and never break that we can tell mm-hmm. or never flounder? I mean, there's yeah. a, there's a, what, my question, I guess, if I have one, is there's a difference between doing televised improv and live improv? Uh, there's a difference in that the televised, everything is faster and shorter. You know, we do two to four minute scenes. Yeah, you so don't do long form. Yeah. It's not like I'm going to take time setting up a character. It's all going to be goofy and wild. We have a little more leeway in the live shows. And um, a lot of it, is just blind belief that it's all going to (laughs) work out and you know i'm incredibly lucky that i'm working with also great improvisers so if i'm not feeling on top of it then i kind of sit back and support them until i kind of get my bearings so there's never there's only been one time uh brad ryan and i did a show in and it was before uh the american who's line it was somewhere in la and the entire audience were other improvisers we died so (laughs) it was one of those we had i think we each had 15 minutes but we kept thinking no we're going to get them and just kept going and digging deeper and deeper in about half an hour it was just horrible we left the stage we got into (laughs) our cars and didn't talk to each other for two weeks. Oh my <laughs> god! So oh my god! So it does happen. It does happen. It does happen. Yeah, I, but that it's was, so much uh, like what you were talking about. If you'd been hypnotized and you just didn't give a damn that the room was full of like people that you actually cared about, you probably would have been fine. Probably would have done better. Yeah, and just because there does become that tension of like, now what do I do? Now what do yeah. I do? <laughs> yeah, and yeah. now it's and certainly after you know forty or. 50 years, however long I've been doing this, it's certainly. And you also get to enjoy the times when you bomb. It becomes a story and, you know, you bomb in a scene, you know, well, I've got the next one. We'll, we'll get out of it. It'll be fine. Oh, well, even going back to Carson, Carson, Johnny Carson, uh, whom now kids are like, who? I can't believe uh, he I was know. funniest when he he was funniest when he actually when his jokes bombed because he, yeah. he was so adept at. At sharing that that ruefulness with the with the audience, so yeah, there's a lesson to be learned from Someone that. that we as talked well. to who also does uh, improv was saying that because uh, I guess what you do is even braver when you're with Brad and you take suggestions from the audience. And one of the suggestions that they got, which was the worst according to her, was Naomi. Yeah, uh, yeah, was homicide. Oh, Naomi speaking. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> homicide. Let's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was what do you do? With that? That? I think it was genocide. Oh it was genocide. It was What's genocide. Because, oh, you know, even funnier. Human <laughs> shooting. <again. laughs> uh, I, yeah, there's there's times um, for some reason we were we were uh, doing off Broadway uh, hip hop, and for the song that I do, I would ask a woman in the front row, "What do you do for a living?" 
and then I'd sing a love song to her about her job. I would say seven out of 10 times, I would get a teacher of special needs children. Oh, oh. Which is lovely for oh. them. <laughs> and we what would all applaud. Them? And then I would go, you know what? You're just going to be a teacher for this <laughs> particular song. Oh, wow. it's so um, yeah. 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 Yeah, there's still some black holes that uh, you don't want to fall into. There are. There are certain things you just can't. Uh, Do you think there are more, you know, Colin? Do you think there are more uh, um, holes to fall into now? I mean, Wendy and I talk a lot when we talk to funny people. It's like, is it harder now to be funny because we're so sensitive and or we're supposed to be so sensitive? Yeah, I think, I, you know, supposed to be is important because we get a lot of audience uh, reactions where you go, OK, what was that about? Because I didn't say anything. You've just made up some sort of thing in your mind. We were doing a scene, Brad and I were doing a scene, um, and it was a spy scene. I said, OK, get in the submarine. And everyone went, oh. I was like, OK. Oh. <laughs> I know that was horrible with that the submarine disaster. But um, that had nothing to do with the scene. You've just made it now about the scene, and everyone's thinking about it. Oh. I think back to like people I grew up with, like all these people who were funny with the limitations of they couldn't swear, they couldn't really do sexual material. So I don't think we're limited. Um, I, I think any limits we come up with in comedy are our, the ones we set on ourselves. I mean, I, I would never do cancer jokes or age jokes or things like that. But I can find things to be funny about that uh, um, people will laugh at. And it doesn't have to be edgy. I mean, I'm just there to be funny. And I can work within those limitations, no problem. Mm. That's so interesting, I find. Uh, we got to wrap up in a, in a minute or two. But I find it really interesting because it's uh, just a really nice way of framing things that it's just different. You know, like there's new rules. There's always new rules. Um, but yeah, that I just want to say you can tell cancer jokes when you've had cancer, which Wendy and I have. So you <laughs> it was know, hilarious. I'm, yeah, I have. I'm not willing to <laughs> go that far. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you, did you hear the one about no? Anyway, um, so what are you, what are you doing now? You're, you're still doing it, some of the hip rob and you're doing some of the. We're doing hip rob in Vegas right now. So I, I, I just got back from that. Um, uh, Brad and I are, are doing some shows this month, I think. And, and right, right into, and right into the new year, yeah. according to your website, you're going to be uh, touring. Yeah, on and off. Uh, my tickets this now. was the my year where now. I was supposed to uh, pull back. I was thinking, you know, I've, during lockdown, I thought, oh, you know what? I could actually retire, I think. Not oh. completely, but at least pull back. So I thought, yeah. So I talked to my agent and said, you know what? I want to pull back a little bit. So after March 2024. Yeah. Well, I'm going to say, if, if you can't get Taylor Swift tickets, go and see Colin and Brad in uh, Scared Scriptless, because it'll We're be We're very surprised. similar in many yeah. ways. <laughs> we do Have a lot of said. jokes about ex-girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> and the outfits. And the outfits. Um, oh. It's been such a pleasure totally talking to you and, uh, and see you around, because we do. We do from time to time. Yeah. Thanks so much for doing this, Colin. We uh, we love you. We think you're funny. Even when you're not, you're funny. Oh, so. well, thanks for having me. Always <laughs> lovely to see you, too. Yeah, lovely. Bye. I guess we're the only ones that think cancer is funny. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where people are, because if they, you haven't had it, and I didn't really think we were going to make this about cancer right now, but <laughs> in terms of things that you can talk about, I mean, I actually, there were, I mean, the fate wearing the prosthetic bra and the wig and I told you that story once where I was wearing a long blonde wig with a prosthetic bra while I was going through treatment and, you know, and get cat called. And I'm thinking I should whip off this wig and lift up my shirt. Cause if only you knew. <laughs> show them. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I, I tried to tell jokes like cancer jokes when I just recovered and was going through treatment and everything at a cancer fundraiser. And they were like, don't be funny. Don't be funny. <laughs> I, I, it, but it, it's true. I mean, only people who've had cancer can sort of understand and, yeah. and, and make jokes about it. But you know what I found most, well, a couple of things I found interesting. One was his, 
sort of interpretation of comedy now that there were these these old stupid rules that well I think they're stupid anyway that you couldn't swear and you couldn't talk about sex now you sort of can mm -hmm. um, but you can't talk about other things so I found that really interesting but the most interesting thing was um, and you kept leaning into it which was great um, was about partnership you know mm -hmm. about how yeah. we're about how we're all different and how we try and find a way of being either an introvert or an extrovert at at particular moments and he's well, uh, that an ambivert an ambivert <laughs> i like that word because i think it describes more people than 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 it doesn't um can you i guess you can't do improv by yourself I guess it's that would be like comedy masturbation. <laughs> yeah, aren't I funny? Oh, I'm so funny. <laughs> I'm so funny. You, I mean, maybe you can with your audience, but you still have to interact with somebody. Yeah, no, um, I'm trying to think of an example, and I can't. I mean, well, I think it, Robin Williams humor. did. I think Robin Williams improvised a lot. He would yeah, go but on. It was tangents. also hilarious. Yeah, he could just. It was just a series of one-liners that were yeah. uh, prompted by an amazing brain and and a few drugs at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Let us not discount that. <laughs> But um, I think the takeaway is that we can all you learn to use improvisation to our benefit, no matter what yes, you do. And you're amazing. You're absolutely <laughs> amazing. Unless you're a dental hygienist, I don't think you can improv <laughs> with your patients. But what about genocide, more? <laughs> oh. <laughs> hmm. I can't even. All right. See you later. Okay. Bye.